Hello, welcome to my channel. Today, let's look at this new topic to prove this inequality. This problem is also selected from a math competition, but this is not the original version. I modified the original version a little bit. So before we start to solve it, let's see what the original version is. So here is the original version, and here is a modified version. If I ask you, which version is easier, what do you think? You can pause this video and compare them, and I will post the answer after 5 seconds. The answer is 2, so the modified version is easier. If your choice is number 1, maybe you think for original version, the power index are integers. But for the modified version, the power index are irrationals, so the original version should be easier. This argument is reasonable, but exactly due to this argument, the modified version should be easier. Here is the reason. For the original version, since all index are integers, it's very likely to distract you to the wrong directions. For example, you might try to use some tricks such as complete square, complete cube, or introduce and subtract some additional terms, or to make a factorization, etc. But all these attempts are on the wrong directions. They are distracting you. On the other hand, if we look at the modified version, since all index are irrational numbers, so there is no hope to do those tricks. In this case, you don't need to waste time on these wrong directions. Then how can we solve it? If you carefully compare these two versions, you might find some hint. The original version is to us to prove this inequality for integer powers. But for modified version, it's us to prove this inequality for irrational powers. So can we make a guess? Maybe this inequality works for all real numbers. So that means, for any non-negative x1 and x2, which x1 is less than x2, then we have this inequality hold. If this is true, then for fx, it must be an increasing function on 0 to infinity. So how can we prove it? So now, our goal is to prove fx is increasing on 0 to infinity. If success, then we can complete both of these two proofs at one time. To prove fx is increasing, we need to show its derivative is non-negative. So we do the derivative for fx, then we get this expression. But here we know for ax, bx, cx, they are all positive because they are exponential functions. However, for log a, log b, and log c, we cannot guarantee they are positive. Recall the given conditions. ABC, they are positive number, and the product ABC is 1. But ABC, maybe some of them can be between 0 and 1. For example, if A is 1 half, then log A is log 1 half, which is negative number. In that case, we cannot guarantee all the three terms are non-negative. Seems we stuck here. But we don't want to give up. Before we proceed, Let's give a new name to the derivative of fx to avoid the confusion. So we define the derivative of fx to be gx. So later on, instead of we call the derivative of fx, we call it gx. So now we want to show gx is non-negative on 0 to infinity. Here I copy the information we got so far. We want to show gx is non-negative for x belongs to 0 to infinity. Let's see what happens if we make a derivative to gx. After we take the derivative to gx, we have the following expression. Surprisingly, we have the square on each term. Since the square is non-negative, and the exponential function they are positive, so all terms are non-negative, then the sum is non-negative. So we have the derivative of gx is non-negative. This means gx is an increasing function on 0 to infinity. 
but our goal is to show gx is non-negative. Here we only get gx is an increasing function. It seems this not helps us at all. Here are some illustrations for the graph of gx. We can see for figure A, this is not good, because the first half of this graph is below the x-axis. That means gx is negative, but we want to show gx is non-negative. But for graph B and graph C, they are good, because all the curves are above x-axis. So the key point is to check the g0. If g0 is non-negative, since gx is increasing, so later on, its function value must collapse up. So that means its curve must be above x-axis, so the gx must be non-negative. Then we are done. I summarized the idea in the box. Now, we already got the derivative of gx is non-negative, which means gx is an increasing function. If we can show the value of g0 is also non-negative, this means the gx function is non-negative on 0 to infinity. Then we complete the proof. So I put the question mark here. We haven't done this step. So the last thing to check is to check g0. Here is the g0. And we know a to the power 0 is 1, b to the power 0 is 1, and c to the power 0 is 1. So we got g0 equals to the sum of the logs. And we can rewrite the summation of log into the product inside the log. So we got log a, b, c. And remember the condition we are given. The product of a, b, c is 1. So we got log 1. So now we got g0 is 0. So I remove the question mark. So we are done, actually. Now let's complete this proof. Since we have proved the derivative of gx is non-negative, and g0 is 0, as illustrated in the figure c, then we immediately got gx is non-negative, and recall that we define gx is the derivative of fx, so that means the derivative of fx is non-negative on 0 to infinity. So that means the fx is increasing on this interval. Therefore, we got these two versions proved at one time. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe my channel if you like it.